to me, that's a better vision for a company to be like, hey man, uh, I, I resigned because I got that thing I wanted to do. So you leave like high five and training everybody. Maybe you come back and you tell people, people can see a path up. You know, because like what you said, maybe it's unique to hear that as a company strategy, but. What does it take to live your best life on your terms? To change how things are done? How do you need to show up as a leader so you feel capable of making a difference? What needs to happen that has us able to confidently say we are truly living, leading, and operating our businesses and our lives from our purpose? Join me over drinks as I go behind the scenes to reveal the freedom, fulfillment, and success this sort of radical thinking has had in the personal and professional lives of my guests. Adventure may hurt you, but monotony will kill you. Marcus Purvis. So what's next for you? Do you know? Have you spent the time to explore it? Perhaps you're clear in moving forward, or perhaps you're waiting for the right time to take action. It's different for everyone, truly. My guest today is Brian Croker, a born and raised Calgarian and president of Little Rock Printing, the latest iteration of his father's original printing company launched in 1994. He shares how that journey unraveled for him, not by design at all, but very serendipitously through simply taking action and doing stuff. The win-win of failing while learning something new. Brian talks about the work required to balance pushing forward and thinking things through with honoring who he was, how he operated, and why that was critical to the journey. And while many organizations try their hardest to retain their top talent for as long as possible, Brian actually doesn't want them to stay. In fact, he encourages them to explore their areas of interest and passion knowing full well they will leave the company. And that's by design. Let's jump into the conversation. I'm Brian Croker, president of Little Rock Printing, Calgary born and raised. I'm the president of my father's printing company that he started in 1994. I've been in part of the business since 2004. Uh, the business originally started as uh, my dad getting laid off as a draftsman, started moving to contractor, uh, eventually leasing a photocopier for the drafting. Uh, kind of, that was a really cool story, but he did that for about seven years, got his MBA, had to decide to stay with the company or do this, jumped into that. I joined in 2004 as a entry level employee that wasn't, I was a young man just working for his dad and slowly got really engaged with the idea of business and that particular business. And from 04 till now have grown into the uh, president's role and have succeeded in our succession planning. Succeeding is hard to say these days, but the succession plan uh, being uh, the transfer ownership of that. And I uh, mean, my wife are the owners of the business and we've moved from a drafting company to a color photocopy company to a document company. We were document services for a while and now we're uh, a traditional print company. And in the last two years, especially this last year, we've uh, had big goals to try to be more of a Vista print kind of business and become more of an e-commerce print company. So that's the story of the business. And I've been, you know, on that ride for 17 years and lived here my whole life. That feels like a long time ago, especially like I went from being 20 and like telling my dad I can't start before 10 a.m. because I'm not going to not going to work, not going to work for me to, um, you know, I would have got fired if I was not related for the first couple of years to then growing up and you know eventually you know going through my 20s which was another period of time where i not focused on maybe business or career but my personal you know figuring out who you are in the world and socializing and then going now to having uh, you know i got four kids and a beautiful wife and family man and so it feels a lot has changed within me during my employment and you know involvement in this business. I'm sure many listening can relate to the journey and priorities of life in our 20s, not really knowing or understanding what to focus on or what's in store for the future and likely being completely okay with that. I, of course, have no idea what it's like to be 20 in this new world. So I'm speaking to you millennial Gen Xers out there. But the pressures around us to find the answers and to figure it out might paint a different picture about the expectations of getting our shit together. 
regardless of who I'm speaking to. For me, I was not even close to doing anything productive in my life. Hell, I had a brain tumor removed at 21. I didn't have any idea how to manage that milestone effectively, let alone knowing what I'm meant to do in the world. But I got through it and started my entrepreneurial journey in my mid-30s with my wife because it made sense to do so. Would I have liked to have started sooner? If you're asking the 42-year-old right now, definitely. But it wasn't up to the me of today to make that choice. A lot of our events and decisions and success have been rooted in serendipity, we've always said, uh, which is, you know, a real thing that you cause by doing stuff. You know, you do this and serendipitous things happen, but your input was attempting things. So, like, when we, basically that story of my dad getting laid off as a draftsman, that was our only customer for the first decade. And then what happened is they started getting busier and we pr- they started printing a lot of reports. So they just grew, they grew for us. And then they actually moved because they got so busy. And at the time we were, let's say a $2 million a year business. And we moved next door to another company that needed printing beside their new building that needed a million dollars a year in printing as well. Just because I, I, I smoked at the time. I smoked the lady that was in charge of doing stuff. And eventually we started doing their stuff. So serendipitously, we kind of like doubled in size. And then in 2010, we won um, like the Chamber of Commerce had the Small Business of the Year Award. So we won it in 2010. Just before they had, they changed it to Small Business Week the next year. So, so our biggest problem, we just kept first up until about 2010, 20, basically until I took over, we just kept falling into big projects of the same thing. <laughs> And our problem at the end of the year would be like, well, what do we do? How do we stay under this tax threshold? And, and then I got met my wife in 2011 and she settled me down and uh, my dad offered me the role of president. And then some, then, then we started real hitting real business challenges and uh, everything we used to touch, we turned to go, we buy this machine, it would get more stuff. We'd move into an expensive building without a business plan. We get new clients, like things were rolling and, uh, and we had some money to work with and then kind of got kicked in the teeth like you should for just kind of not using the the rules of deduction. Contrasting experience is the greatest teacher to witness and be an active participant in what doesn't work to grapple with the attempts, the wins and failures gives us what we need to adjust our trajectory. If you're aware and intentional about it, that is when you try stuff, stuff happens. Just don't know what. Uh, ideally experience will let you know to not try the same thing if it if you know the outcome you know similar stuff or to do it again but it's happened quickly like i met my wife i got that job and then we see 2014 economy for the first time in my working career because oh wait we skipped right over it because there was enough binders and stuff to do so for in 2014 uh we had our first real lost an account to that big customer was laying people off. So we started to have to pivot and adjust. But fortunately, the one thing we did with a lot of our profits over over those years was buy new equipment in other areas. So we invested in signage without any division in signage because we had made money. And so those future investments wound up giving us the ability to plant new seeds into new markets. So although like I've taken over as president, me me and my dad work really well together. And the two of us have kind of just always sat in those two roles of, you know, Two business guys trying to figure it out. I, I, I moved my office around again today. Like people walk by, they're like, I, every time I clean it, I move my desk. I like change. I like just moving the needle. Uh, I've, I liked, uh, I coached hockey for 10 years, not just like 15 year olds and 13, 14, 15 year olds, but I like doing stuff and seeing what happens. And I, once you get addicted to that process that you're either going to win or you're going to like learn something new, as long as I can afford you know, now I'm learning to, I have to be able to afford the lesson. Uh, so getting better at that. Can I just invest half a million dollars in a machine, all, you know, and get it wrong multiple times. Uh, so I'm not trying to be more, you know, diligent, but I like, I like trying new things. Like I, I took over our website a couple years ago and now I, I built the whole thing. I did have some help from a contractor for a period, but started on GoDaddy, went to Shopify, um, hired somebody to help me go to WooCommerce. But then I've taken it back and then when I took it back, I broke it all and put new themes on, hosted it myself, changed it. And I really like, like, oh, what does that do? What does that do? And even though you might hear me swearing and like, oh no, or, or almost crying. 
it's like, no, that's part of the process. I'm enjoying it. Like, that's what you do. Like, so I just like, and so I like having things to tinker with. The nature of the tinkerer, the explorer, and the curious doer. We are natural disruptors. Combine that with an industry like print, and you have a formula for adventure and wonder. The magic of a well-designed printed piece can inspire all the senses. And if you're like Brian, someone who is constantly exploring what could be done, you will always find yourself needed in the marketplace. We are critical to the specialists of the world. We keep them relevant and help them push their own boundaries of what's possible. My employment journey was I did start and leave a couple times to be a bartender and I went to hotel and restaurant management school at SAIT. That was the one I picked when my dad said, you, you need to do something. So I'm going to take you to this open house, pick a table. Like you have to do something. So, yeah. I'm like, oh, that, I like, I like, I like beer and restaurants. So I'll, I'll do this one. Right. So I went up working in a bunch of that hospitality and a lot of that has stuck with me. And kind of the vision where we moved our printing, to, it's this weird paradox where there's no regulatory printing. You don't need to print your PowerPoint presentation, annual report, catalog, et cetera. But 99% of organizations do printing. So that means what you're left with is stuff that they really, really want or thinks would enhance something, which, which I think takes back to my, so everything we're trying to add on the website, I just like, here's the whole price book and we're trying to make the catalog available so that every machine we buy, we're trying to make it, can I make one sticker on the same machine at the same quality that make a thousand? Because I think where that matters to people, it's like one customer coming in for, with their spouse for a $50 meal. In the big picture of that restaurant's business, you know, that $50 line item does, doesn't mean a lot, but to them that might be their only dinner out for the week. That might be what, and that experience matters. You know what I mean? So like a lot of what we do, like even our checking table for a while was like an expo line. Like it's almost the exact same format, like making sure it's perfect. Uh, so like what I think the big win for people now is like we do a lot of like labels or or artists print like 10 prints for their Etsy store. And it like it matters so much. And they open it up like it's Christmas. And then when they get a label for their 12 candles that they made and it looks just like the labels at the store, that like feels the best. So trying to bring that accessibility uh, to that level of quality, because knowing that you don't have to do it, you could sell candles blank. You could go to a fair and sell anything you want with just your phone and a Instagram and a Clover, right? And you're set. And those $7, $8, $10, $100, the business model around that is the same as a Vistaprint. I think the Vistaprint model is the $50 average order and a billion a year. So you're trying, it's that food and beverage, it's the coffee. What can we do for five or 10 bucks where we don't drive our margins down, but we offer it to lots of people and they're all kind of similar. It's almost just the general demand though. Like even like this podcast, like we, you have enough gear here that you fit it in your, in your pocket, but you, you, I bet want it to sound just as good as a full studio. We become audacious to uh, perfection. Like, Hey, I, I want this size, but I want it just as good as that size. Because I feel like it's, with the internet, it's available somewhere. Someone has brought it to my level in terms of quantity at that quality. And it's just, and that's where we're trying to match. So it's not even just printing, I think it's just everything. Like, you know, Dr. Dre headphones, right? Like, I want studio quality headphones. Like, everything's about what can I get to that quality for my one? Well, it's like food service, right? Like, you just, you can't put a crappy uh, version of the clubhouse out tomorrow. In our business, what I think is what, where the gap is when you see the closures of print companies. So again, we have a unique market where 99% of people or businesses or organizations need it. Not many businesses sell to everybody, but the perception is, and it's true that there's a lot of bankruptcies in our business. And it's because what's happened is that throwaway printing, that, you know, the IKEA catalog's gone. The annual reports are no longer regulated. Uh, PowerPoint meetings don't go with 50 decks. People don't walk downstairs for 40 copies. Like the stuff that wasn't getting read that didn't matter, you know, if you're still on that model, like nobody reads these anyways, that's where you get, ha or you have equipment that's meant for, well, nobody reads these, so we'll just print them and they'll be fine. It's like those 12 for 11 people with one extra, like they all matter. Regardless of whether you are selling a product or an experience, how you leave people feeling is one of the end results you wanna take advantage of. And in a rapidly evolving marketplace that's mostly digital, the touch factor becomes a huge brand differentiator. 
whether it's one or 1,000. To know that the experience I get will be consistent across all areas of product testing at Little Rock gives me no reason to explore any other provider. Unless, of course, they don't provide that product. And that is also a big opportunity in the product business. So do you know what your clients are looking for and what's not working for them? Do you have communication channels open to encourage that and address the need? Your story of we've always done it that way is not just leaving piles of money on the table. It's also factoring whether your business will still be around in five years. I think one thing that's on my mind lately, and this is a constant learning curve, like opinions on this would probably, if you interviewed me every year, it would change because you're just constantly learning what you think was working and whatever. But that is understanding where you're at, jobs you offer, where they would properly fit in someone's successful life journey. So like uh, I, had a, I had a talk with a guy in our shop today. He's in early 20s, mid 20s. And, you know, this is not what he's doing for me. He's a star. Like, but if he's with us when he's 30, 40, 50 years old, that doesn't match. Like if I overpaid, even if I overpaid him, it's not why he's there. It's a job to make some good money while he maybe matures or settles or establishes who he wants and gets to the next point in his life. So um, I guess that, that one's fresh in my mind because I met with him today about that. And it's just like, you know, you're not supposed to be here in five years from now. Like you're, you, you, you have a specific job you want to do later. What are you doing to get it? Right. So, but also he, this employee on this example, he's a, he, he, he does such a good job on the product. So his day-to-day -day satisfaction is this human that I helped today was, I did a good job. And I think there's a win there. And then, you know, I don't have a lot of executives or those kind of things or a, a long career path in our business. We might have a long tenure, but I think one thing that I've stumbled in over, over the years, like we used to have reward programs for five and 10 years. And I think sometimes those, aren't appropriate for every role. Like, you know, if I'm really helping somebody in three years, I should help them get a, a better job. So like no lateral moves, but what am I doing to get this guy up the food chain in the world? Cause, you know, or gal. So that's one of the things on my mind these days about leadership is, okay, what's what's the story here? Like, where, where do you really fit in what you do? Like, cause the worst thing you can do is wind up overpaying somebody at, a, at an age like, almost stunting their growth. Well, yeah, if you start with me when you're 18 and then I also pay you 80 grand to fold paper, you're like, I don't know, it's pretty cozy. When my dad uh, got his MBA in 2001, the company he originally got laid off to and became our client, he got hired back as the administration manager. There were 700 people. And his boss at the time said, um, hey, you just finished your MBA. You're qualified to be a principal here. Like you could hire stakes and, and uh, more pay. He says, and in fact, everybody in the company is getting a raise this year of at least 6%. And he goes, I know you have that photocopy business down the hall and you just got your master's in business. Your raise this year is 0%. How's the photocopy business doing down the hall? And it was it was really a tough choice for me. The, the comfy choice, like if they got to like, here's a 15% raise, a vehicle and some stock options. You would have kept them, would have shut the business down. And that wasn't the right journey for him. And, and that was a good example of good leadership going, you don't need more in this role. You need to move on and fly and tell people you were here before. And, and then people can see that this is a place that doesn't stop. My vision is that all organizations become a catalyst for purpose, self-discovery and meaningful work. Now, the default operating system upstairs might have you think that purpose and meaningful work needs to fit within the mold of your organization. If you take anything away from Brian's story here is that there is no mold and that you get to say why that is and how to make a positive impact happen for your people because you know what will make the difference for them. Maybe you're like Brian. Maybe your place as a leader is to be a conduit for others to be able to move towards the next milestone. And that to keep them in their current role would not only be a disservice to the organization, but also to everyone else seeking their own version of meaning and purpose. 
This is no longer a reactive measure to keep the lights on, but an intentional strategy that keeps you on the bleeding edge of innovation with new talent and new perspectives, while contributing to the growth and success of your people and the economy. Get to know your people. Understand their dreams and aspirations for the future. Become their biggest advocate and champion for what's possible. To me, that's a better vision for a company to be like, Hey man, uh, I, I resigned because I got that. I'm doing what I, I've got that thing I wanted to do. So you leave like high five and training everybody. Maybe you come back and you tell people. People can see a path up. You know, because like what you said, maybe it's unique to hear that as a company strategy. But I don't think, in my experience, it's unique for the business owners to think that way. You know, like most business owners, are like yeah, I, I want to sell it one day and get a better company or a better job. So why wouldn't why wouldn't you want that for the people? You're like you're like well you you don't want to be here for more than five more years because not because you want to fail, but because you want to be able to have something you could sell and be proud of. But the challenge is just getting that time with each other. Like we're we're only a dozen staff right now, and I still even you and me I'm trying to meet to three however many. It's getting that time to do the 30, 69 minutes is the biggest challenge. Parkinson's law is defined as work expanding to fill the time allotted. How have you prioritized things? Perhaps an evaluation of how you've grouped things is in order. You can't do everything or be everything to everyone. So how are you enabling your people to grow into the rock stars you know them to be? This makes space available for those important but not urgent line items that make the difference, like nurturing your people. You know, one thing that has happened serendipitously from that is like, I put the people in place, I buy all the equipment, I understand how it works, I know what kind of people we need to spot, but uh, it's the point, I don't know how to use any of the gear back there. Like, I, if it was just me, it would work, no chance. <laughs> like, I don't know. I know what it does and how fast it should go and what kind of skills we need. Um, and what that's left with is, I'm a meddler or a disruptor, right, or a tinker. Well, fortunately, I can't tinker with those things and, you know, one of the good one good leadership skills is get good people and get out of their way. Well, fortunately, because I can't, uh, because I put myself in a spot where I don't know, I don't go on the rip and like, oh, we should print it in this order. Like, how are we doing back here? Are these out? Can we do these in a day? This machine fast enough? This slow enough? So um, that has shown me serendipitously, you know, that value of space and time and given support, like, let me know what you need, but here's the deadline and all the due dates. I, I, I'll never forget, we are at the kitchen table. I was a mediocre baseball player at best. I remember telling my dad, I'm like, the new, the new season started, we've been a couple weeks in, and I remember sitting at the table, like an eight-year-old and nine-year-old, like, coach hasn't let me pitch yet this year. My dad's, well, did, you, did you ask him? I put my hand up when he asked you pitch. He's like, well, if you want to pitch, why don't you ask him if you can pitch? So, and he gave me, his, he just pulled the thing out. He's like, call him. And we had like the wall phone. So I'll never forget. Being, I still can picture myself in that room like, hi, Mr. Wilson. Um, it's Brian from the baseball team. Hi. Oh, hi, Brian. Can I pitch sometimes? You want to start tomorrow? And that, I think that route, and it's probably because my dad's like, I don't know, you figure it out. Like, you know, it really like, wasn't like, this will be a great moment. No. It was more like, I was trying to eat my dinner and you, all you do is talk. Why don't you call the coach, you know? And I think that seed of like, I can still feel I, the white phone with the gray buttons. I can still picture it all. Knowing how important it is that letting people like win or learn on their own is pretty big. The DNA of that person, the kid, everything's going to be a win. Because every human's been like, well, my dad used to, if they were bad to you, and that's what made me good at this. Or I got locked in my room, so I have self-awareness. Like the winner will take every event, either they'll get nurtured and grow, or they'll get hammered on and learn and grow. And what successful person hasn't thanked their parents for either being great to them or being tough on them? Every speech is like, I like to thank my dad for, and it's like, they all did it differently, but they all squeezed out a positive, like if it wasn't for you being either mean or nice, fill in the blank, I wouldn't have got here. You know, when you're a leader, it takes a long time to see some of the ripple effects. There's no way to get your tr the true effect of what you've done immediately. Like what you see on somebody's face will never be their true reaction. And then, you know, the gossip, the, the mole, their opinion of what everybody said also won't be. 
So like you really have to wait. Everything you do has got a long lead time of the effect. So you gotta look for cues. Something I'm thinking about actively these days is, you know, slowing down in the moment, knowing what Matt, like Parkinson's law, like, like I'm stressed today, but like if I go fast here and this guy's talking about his father being in the hospital and I move on, well, that, that ripple effect is more significant. So I think, you know, that's that maturity, like that I am constantly trying to find or my wife pointing out to me that I missed or, you know, like, again, trying to be honest to the right level of honest, like uh, some of the mistakes I know we've made or I've seen be made is oversharing. Like there's always just this paradox of being like, share, be honest, don't share that and don't be too honest, like, you know, uh it, so like not to be deceitful but like just like marketing or sales there's no there's no brush stroke for 10, 10 different clients you can't just like send one email to 10 people and expect it to land the same way it's the same as coaching a, a sports team or whatever it's like you know david does david does not like to be yelled at in front of the group like he needs to be talked to about something and actually i need to talk to the person beside him about something related. He'll pick up on it and he'll know that that's something he needs to do. Whereas Billy, like he's waiting for me to call him out, make him stand up and let him have it. Cause he's like, just wake me up. So just understanding situations and moments. And then I think that disruption of, I don't know what to do here. I'm gonna try this with David today. Just constant experimentation, but you have to trying to be finding the result. Cause I think that's the worst is doing science experiments and not watching the beaker. I literally was bragging to my dad yesterday about the website. We were 95% online, right? I'm like, this is working so good. I got the full price book. A, literally a cowboy bang, started banging on the do locked door because we're COVID locked down, appointment only. I can't figure out your email. Like I literally was sitting bragging about our system and some guy drove there and knocked on the door and humbled me like, well, some people are gonna need, when the doors open again, we can't just do this. I can't not just, we have to do online chat, but some people need phone. Not everybody needs phone. Some people need in person. Not everybody needs in person. Some people can go online. Like, and it's like, okay. And then you get, and it's just, oh, not too much online, too much phone, too much chat. Like, and you just literally every day you're, it's like playing with the audio on that. You just dialing up, dialing down, di too much. Never go past six. Okay. <laughs> but don't always leave it at five. Like, and you just, everything just, and that's what makes it fun. And it's science versus baking. Like you guys still have your grandma's cookie recipe. Like she nailed it in 1936. This is how you make an oatmeal raisin cookie. This order, this recipe. Don't touch it, it's perfect. Whereas business and everything else is like, that was good six months ago, but with the new atmosphere, uh, that formula will 5% worse, right? Like it moves on you. The right leadership changes everything. And for our next generation of game changers striving to achieve what is yet to be achieved, you must be willing to do what has never been done. So make ripples, lead the charge, create cool shit that shows others the way to be braver, brighter, and better than we were yesterday. Personally, you owe it to yourself. The more we come together more intentionally to support one another, the sooner we'll all find ourselves not just living, but contributing to the creation of the vibrant, connected communities that fuel dreams. It takes a certain leader to make this happen. So who comes to mind that you would like to hear from? Please let me know and I'll see what I can do to make it happen. Thanks so much for listening.